Fantastic to see you all. Thank you very much. I know the nights are long and uh, noisy in Sheffield, so thank you for being here at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, we've got an amazing panel here today. Uh, we're going to talk about climate change, the biggest story of our times. Um, and in many ways, it is the biggest story. What other story combines global politics, global economics, migration, natural disasters, everything you can think of, and most fundamentally, the future of our planet. It is a massive story. And yet, we all still struggle to get the message across. Filmmakers still struggle to get funded. Broadcasters are sniffy. Audiences are hard to find. So, um, so those are the kind of subjects we want to talk about. These are all filmmakers, apart from Professor Joe Smith from the Open University, who um, does a lot of academic research into climate change, and particularly in, in the area of media and broadcasting. Uh, so they're all going to talk about their films. They've all been um, out there struggling to make these brilliant, brilliant films, and you'll see they're all quite different. Um, and so everyone's going to talk a bit about that, and then we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, and then one of the things I'd just like to plant in your head is that we were talking about, um, is there one thing that we could do, should be doing in our lives, that actually helps the story of climate change get more um, attention? Uh, so we're going to have a brief conversation about that amongst ourselves at the end, towards the Q&A, but I'd love you to start thinking about that, your views on that, what you think you should, could be doing. Um, and then we'll sort of have a brief discussion about that. And at the end, if we can come to consensus, I'd love it if we all, all everybody in this room, sort of agreed to sign up to some kind of pledge that we all think is a good idea and take that out of this room and enact it. And then between us, there's how many people in here? 50 people? If all 50 of you do something to another 50 people, that's 100 people and it exponentially grows. So if you can all think, think about that, that would be brilliant. Um, so on the panel, let me introduce, we've got um, Ash Potterton, a fantastic filmmaker, um, a veteran of many, many, many brilliant documentaries that have played around the world. Uh, Julia Dar, um, who's got a film actually screening in the festival called Thank You for the Rain, which is very exciting. And, and Julia was just saying she actually pitched that film in Meat Market. So here she is back. How many years later? Three, I think. Yeah. Three years later, screening her documentary that, had, that got off the Meat Market. So if any of you have got ideas here, here's evidence that it works, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Joe Smith, who we just introduced, and then Will Anderson from Keo Films, um, who are uh, known to many of us for um, a lot of the documentaries on uh, fish fight and environmental waste that have played on Channel 4 and uh, BBC. Uh, so a fantastic panel. Uh, they've all come at climate change in very different ways. Um, so, uh, Ash, first of all, uh, you made a brilliant documentary called Man Made Planet uh, for Channel 4. Uh, should we just kick off and, and show the clip and, and sort of set uh, the mood? Actually, I'm going to show some still. Uh, or talk about it first and we'll, we'll finish with the clip. But, okay. uh, um, so... Um, this film, Man Made Planet, started when we were um, uh, one of a number of con companies contacted by Channel 4 last year and asked to come up with a film pegged around uh, Earth Day. Uh, and to be would honest you just with... Before, would you oh, have ever pitched a climate change film if it hadn't been for that intervention by the broadcaster? Uh, probably not. Uh, Why because, not? I was, because I was about to say we weren't exactly wildly enthusiastic okay. about the prospect. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think the sort of feeling, particularly from our uh, creative director, John Smithson, was that this was just... Uh, it, it was a bit of a, a hospital pass. It felt a bit of a poison chalice. Um, you know, there was a feeling that sort of environmental films were sort of quite um, sort of preachy and do-goody and, and sort of told you off. And there was, you know, we only really wanted to do something if we felt that we could do something that felt genuinely different. Um, and the, um, the sort of light bulb moment, as it were, came when we thought back to an event which we had done for Channel 4 a few years earlier um, called Live from Space. And suddenly occurred to us that, of course, nobody's got a better view of what's happening down on Earth um, than the astronauts. Um, so what if we did it from, um, um, from their POV? Um, we then discovered that it was 45 years since, uh, since this image was taken, the blue marble, um, taken by, captured by the astronauts aboard Apollo 17, um, the only image of the whole Earth ever to be taken um, by a human. Um, now, you know, sort of granted 45 years wasn't the sort of best anniversary ever, but, um, it, uh, uh, you know, this was one of the most sort of iconic and uh, widely distributed images of all time. And, you know, it made us think about what if we were to use that 45-year period as uh, the kind of time frame in which to explore the impact that humanity um, has, um, has wrought upon the Earth. 
Um, so the main components of this film, alongside the kind of astronaut testimony, would be um, satellite uh, imagery um, uh, from the NASA satellites. Um, this is a you know uh, example of uh, kind of before and after in the Amazon base, and that just gives you a kind of indication. You'll you'll see more in the clip in a moment, um, and then. Um, um, you know, these would lend themselves to some really sort of potentially quite compelling time-lapse sequences. Um, and then, in addition, sort of human stories down on the ground. But we had a kind of, um, we, we had a sort of rule from the outset that we were really after sort of quite inspirational human stories down on Earth um, that would effectively... Um, um, that would have effectively encapsulate the stories that we were trying to tell from space, but we didn't want any politicians, we didn't want any lobbyists, uh, even any scientists. Um, in fact, we sort of had this kind of rule, we didn't want anything that felt like a sort of David Shookman report, you know, the BBC environment correspondent off with uh, some sort of scientists on an ice cap somewhere sampling ice cores. Um, and, you know, what was kind of holding this together, um, this is one of the places actually where we filmed, um, was that quite neatly it turned out that the, um, in the 45 years since the blue marble image was taken, that the human population, the global human population, actually doubled to 7.4 billion. Um, 45 years ago, um, at the point of when the blue marble was taken, this was just a cluster of fishing villages, uh, and now it's a mega city of 12 million people in China called, uh, called Shenzhen. And that sort of colossal exponential increase in, um, in global population has placed kind of unprecedented demand for more shelter, um, more energy and more food, uh, and the quest to, um, to kind of to fulfill and meet those resources really became the, um, became the backbone of the film. And what became sort of quite apparent early on was there, there was a really interesting balance at the heart of this film which is that, on the one hand, humanity has never been sort of capable of more extraordinary things. This is another one of the places where we filmed um, literally turning the desert green in, um, uh, in Jordan. This is in the Wadi Rum Desert. This is pivot irrigation um, in uh, Jordan's biggest um, organic farm. Um, so we've never been, you know, our kind of levels of ingenuity and resourcefulness have never been greater. Uh, but on the other hand, um, there's our negative impact on the environment, and you know, in the film, for example, we look at the um, um, the connection between um, between climate change and hurricanes through the uh, aftermath of uh, of Hurricane Matthew. Um, but I, I sort of think overall, the kind of main point um, is that this was never packaged as a climate change film. You know, th this was a film that you'd want to come to in its own rights because it promised um, an extraordinary perspective of looking down on Earth um, from space. Actually, it's just... it's, 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 there are moments where it's quite shocking where you actually see the change, you know, inland seas disappear, yeah. villages turn into megacities. And we'll... It is quite shocking. And, and did you, were you shocked by what you found? Have you been, you know, were you surprised by how fired up you have been by this experience? I mean, Has it I mean, changed it was, you? It was interesting that, like, um, that... Um, you know, I think the kind of the you know, watching Twitter as it goes out, the kind of stock response was, or the most common response was, um, beautiful and amazing, but terrifying. And I think it, um, you know, we, um, you know, we wanted to make a film that was, you know, that on the one hand, it's like, um, you know, on the one hand, it was like a, a sort of a love letter to the planet, but on the other hand, it was a kind of a suicide note. And I think what the film does is kind of straddle both of those. Um, it straddled both of those things. So it was never, um, like I said, it was never um, packaged as a climate change film, but, you know, it had that... Did you, I mean, you, I know you had it. quite a lot of conversations about tone, because I think if you go, I think we all know, that if you make too doom and gloom climate yeah. change, people will just go, we're all doomed, we're all fucked, so what, I can't do anything about it. Um, so how did, you know, how complex were the, the conversations about tone and, and, and how much you want to frighten shock people, but, yeah. you know, how, how did you manage yeah. that? I mean, it's, to be honest, the answer to that is, is very difficult because, you know, we weren't... It would have been really easy to uh, set out to make a film that, you know, said from the outset that we're all doomed. And I think, to be honest with you, at one point, we might have actually gone a bit too far the other way. And I think there was a bit of... 
you know, there was some, I wouldn't quite say sort of horse trading, there was some balancing that required within the film at the end to make sure that we had a tone that felt accurate and fair to, on the one hand, the kind of the potential of the extraordinary things that mankind is capable of, but also was sending a very clear warning signal about uh, the damage that we're doing, um, that we're doing to the planet. But, uh, should, we, think, should we have a look yeah, at the clip? Yeah, I mean, the best should thing is have, um, have a look at the clip. What have we done, Ash? What's your view on what we're doing, what we've done? Um, well, I think my view is that, um, you know, and certainly the outcome of the film is that, it, you know, it's a bit of a, um, you know, it is a kind of a, a, a call to action because on the one hand that, um, you know, there are extraordinary things, you know, technology in particular has kind of underpinned uh, a sort of capability for us to kind of revolutionise our world, but also all of these things, you know, have trade-offs as well, and I think it's being conscious and aware of what those trade-offs are. So, for example, you know, in that, exa you know, um, in, um, in Jordan, when they're turning that desert green, that, you know, that's obviously because there's an aquifer underneath there, but that has got finite resources. Let's just explain that's like a massive underground exactly, lake. Exactly, yeah. you know, and that's, you know, some estimates are that that will run dry, you know, perhaps as soon as sort of 50 years. So, um, you know, I think um, what the film does is that it, you know, it illustrates that, um, you know, that very, very delicate um, balance that the astronauts, you know, speak uh, very profoundly about from space. I think it's being, you know, aware of, um, you know, of the impact of, um, of our actions. I mean, it's very much a <clears throat> quite a lot of conversation around how you tackle climate change. It's obviously it's a macro subject; it affects the whole globe, um, but it's also micro because it affects us all individually. This is very much a macro take on the subject. Sure. Did that help you tell the story that you were distance and from it, literally distance from um, the space? Did that sort of because it is so complex? Did the sort of taking that sort of macro view enable you to tell a? a an, a, a to, a, to a degree, but I mean, it also sort of presented quite an interesting challenge about how you actually get down to earth, because you know, and that was a clip from uh, from the sort of top end of the film. But actually, you know, there are five different points in the film where we come down and almost sort of literally pluck out an individual down on earth and follow their, you know, that specific story through the kind of prism of that, um, through the prism of that individual. On the one hand, yes, it gives you a kind of epic canvas um, through which to tell that story, but there were sort of creative challenges in that film about how do you sort of bounce up and down from, from earth um, to space. But I think one of the things that's successful about it is that kind of varying sense of sort of scale on which the film operates. So on the one hand, you're able to kind of luxuriate in those sort of epic views from space, but on the other hand, there are some, you know, very, um, uh, you know, quite profound individual sort of um, journeys who we go on with, pe you know, with people down down on Earth. So it manages to be both sort of yeah, epic and intimate uh, at the same time. So you, you started this journey with this film, going, oh, it's poison chalice, oh, it's god damn it, god damn it, a broadcast is also to make a documentary. Yeah. If only everybody in the room thinking. Yeah. Um, so having done that. Are you making another climate change? Are you going to make another climate change film? Are you now an, uh, an activist? Um, I, I look, um, the film was, um, I think, the, you know, the film by any real measure was, was very successful. I mean, you know, for Channel 4, it, um, um, <coughs> you know, it ended up with about 1.8 million, which was uh, very right. successful. Fantastic. But also, um, you know, what was interesting is that um, you know, the amount of, I think on the first TX, the amount of 16 to 34 viewers was up 73% on the slot, which is pretty extraordinary by any kind of measure. And I think that that's certainly now That's one way to certainly feel... get broadcasters' attention. Exactly. <laughs> and that makes feel there's, uh, there's an appetite for, for more in that space, yeah. So we are converted to a degree. <laughs> Brilliant. Fantastic. I just wanted to apologise to Jeff as well, because when I did the introductions, I went down that way and then didn't come back to Jeff. So this is Jeff Olaski. He's also got a film at Sheffield called Chasing Corals, so apologies, Jeff. It's just like, I said the one thing I was nervous about was not getting everybody's names wrong, and that's exactly what I did, so sorry. Um, so, uh, so that's obviously a very macro, global take. Uh, Julia Dard's here um, with the film Thank You for the Rain, and that, this, to me, is a very micro take on the subject, isn't it? It's a very personal, human story. Um, so you, in the film, you, you are in the film, part of it, and you come from, you are an activist. So what came first? Were you an activist that, that discovered that filmmaking would help you, or were you a filmmaker that chose this subject? I would say actually both <laughs> together. 
Um, so I was doing some films, but then I was also volunteering in the, in the civil society organization that works on how to spread information about how climate change is affecting farmers in the global south. And that's when I learned that it's the biggest injustice of our time, that those who did nothing to cause climate change are the first and hardest hit. And I felt that that injustice story was not, not being told. And, and to me, I get very angry with social injustice, and I felt this is a climate story that really needs to be told. So how, how, do, you, how do you go from being an outraged citizen to getting on a plane and, and actually finding that the central character, I don't know if anybody's seen the film, I urge you to see all these films, uh, central character is a Kenyan farmer called Kasulu. How did you find him? How did you, how did you go from angry, angry activist to filmmaker engaging him? So I, yeah, so I, I decided I wanted to make, make this film and it would be different than films, climate change films telling statistics or the story of polar bears and melting icebergs. Um, and then I, I, knew, I knew Kenya from before. So, so I went to Kenya and, and I tried to find a farmer, farmer family that would like to collaborate. And then I, I met Kisilu and he's just this amazing guy. Should, yeah. we just, should we just show a clip to introduce him? Can, uh, can we wait a little bit? I just want to talk through a little bit more. Is it yeah, right? sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the film is made um, in collaboration with, with Kisilu, and it follows Kisilu, um, and he's, he's a family farmer in Kenya, and it follows him over five years. Uh, and it follows, and it's made with our observational footage and also Kisilu's own video diary footage. So it's very much a collaborative. But that was very key. So. He, he almost didn't agree to do it unless you gave him access to having his own voice, didn't he? Was that was that a, that was obviously an easy negotiation for you? You presumably just loved that idea. Yeah, that that was amazing. And and I think that's something that really brings us into the psychological dilemma and the psychological challenges of climate change and how it's this climate change is. It's this abstract beast that just can hit you at any time. And, and who's the enemy? Who, how are you going to fight it? It's just, it's, it's such a psychological challenge. And I think that's been, I haven't seen that in many other films to go into the psychological challenges. So, it, so the film follows Kisilu's complete transformation from a farmer and a father who's challenged by climate change and that then takes action in his local community and goes all the way to the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris as a local leader. Uh, however, he ends up also spending less and less time at home because he's doing all of this engagement. So it's also about the impossible dilemma of having to decide whether the best father is an available father in the present or a father who fights for his children's future. And I think that's very key in this film. It's this family value driven story and that it's so intimate and you get so close to the family and also there's lots of humor and joyful moments so it's it's also a lot of uplifting moments together with all the challenges and i think that that communicates to an audience that wouldn't normally watch traditional climate change films so i would love to show one clip from the film uh, the family has been waiting for rain for such a long time and they're they've been really struggling through the drought it's the worst drought in decades and then this clip shows the rain finally coming. It's, if you've seen The Hobbit, it's an extraordinary moment. The joy of the rain, the, the laughter of the family, and then what, what I mean, I'm sure you're talking about this, but what actually happens is a massive storm, and the roof of their house is completely ripped off. So in the space of a few hours, they go from elation to economic devastation. And it's, uh, I mean, I've never cried in a climate change film. I have in this one. And it's just the engagement with that family. So, I mean, you were there when that happened. I mean, how, how you know, how, as a filmmaker, obviously you want to capture that, but, you know, when you actually see the effect of climate change that close up, how, how is that to deal with? Uh, terrifying, <laughs> extremely challenging, yeah. It was, yeah, we, we were shocked and it was, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I still have a problem seeing that scene. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a devastating moment. And it's, and it's one of several devastating moments that they go through. And so, so in terms of, you know, you, you spent a long time making this film. Five years, you said, in total? Or seven. Seven years in total. So, so you, the, 
that shows in the film because of the quality of the intimacy you have with Casino and his family. But can you tell us about how, as a filmmaker, you, you sustained yourself over that long time and, and what are the benefits of having that time to make that film? So we, we didn't plan initially to, to be filming together for five years. We were supposed to film only over one rainy season, but then this storm brought us closer together and also we got Kisilu just keep doing so many amazing things that we have to follow up on. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's the collaboration and, and also Kisilu has so much energy and so much, he's been giving so much into the project, but that just gives the energy to continue. And I think, so, so here the house is it's destroyed, but what's amazing is Kisilu, he just refuses to give up. He rebuilds the house, he brings the community together, and he inspires them to start planting trees and to start building this movement for climate resilience. And that's just, um, yeah, it's just been so, so great to be following his, his, him building this movement. And I, think, and I think that brings me to the second point of what makes this film communicate to a wide audience, because it's, it's not mainly a film about the problem, it's mainly a film about a person and a community who's doing everything they can to to make things better. Um, and, and I, so when audiences watch it, they, they say they become very inspired. And many has told me that they, after seeing it, that they really want to follow Kisilu's lead and now take action in their own local community. And, and they see all the practical things that Kisilu are doing and they're thinking, okay, I can also do something locally. I'll just, I just have to start. So, you know, do you think this is the way forward? Should we all be making emotionally engaging films? And have, have documentaries up till now been guilty of <clears throat> taking a factual, dispassionate view on the subject? And, and would you advocate a change to the tactics that you've used to get to spread the message? Um, I think it's important that we have different films for different kind of audiences. And I'm so grateful for some of the films that's been going ahead of this one. <laughs> And really, because when we started working on it, it was so hard to pitch the film. We couldn't say this is a, like, we couldn't say this film touches on climate change because people would just be like, whoa, we don't want to touch, touch the film. Uh, well, I think the films that have been going before this has really made the way for this film to now have its space. So I think we need different, different kind of films. But I definitely think there's, it would be great to have more films with a personal story. I think there's a brilliant moment because I think obviously it's about climate change and, and his campaign to plant trees to change the, literally change his micro um, climate. Uh, but there's a fantastic moment because you, you take him to Norway and there's a brilliant moment of seeing a Kenyan farmer seeing snow and, you know, it's fantastic. But there's a genius sequence where nobody speaks, nobody says anything. He just films a bank of bread rolls in a supermarket. And you've seen his family literally having a bowl of porridge for over two days. And, and, and it's just a brilliant moment because you just, it stops you in your tracks. And so he became, he's become an incredible commentator, not only on his own world, but on ours too. How has it changed him? Um, going to Norway and, and yeah. Paris and the whole journey. Um, so before he was invited to Norway, we were, we were very much wondering like, should we, should we pass on that invitation? Like, like how would it change him? And, and in the end, we were like, okay, he needs to make that decision. We just pass on the invitation and then... But what's just been so incredible is Kisilu, he always turns everything he learns. It's like something that he can use in some way. So for him, going to Norway was like, wow, I spoke at this event and professors listened to me. And, and at that time, he was having a hard time being listened to in his own community. And, and they are listening to me that means I have something important. Like, he, he uses, like, whatever. So that's, that's in, like, and also he saw all these groups and people organizing things in Norway, and that really inspired him to create more groups at home. So he's, uh, he's amazing in taking the good parts yeah. <laughs> and not all the challenging parts. Though he is asking me a lot of tricky questions, of course. But yeah, I mean, you, he also <laughs> goes to the, to the big climate change convention in Paris, uh, and... Uh, and has a very difficult moment when he realises that the world is not listening to him. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real, and, and you know, it's, it has, and I'm sure as all filmmakers, environmentalists, that, you know, that moment where you do so much and yet you can't seem to make change. Is that something that bogs you down or something that fires you up? Fires me up, yeah. We definitely, we need to bring, we need to bring Kisilu's story 
out to a really wide audience. And uh, and I think it's yeah, it just it gives me a lot of motivation to carry to carry on. Like we have more work to do. Um, and I think this film with this film we can actually reach an audience that isn't normally that concerned or aware about climate change. Uh, and Kisilu is bringing it out in, in his community in Kenya and he's bringing it to policymakers and to farmers and to NGOs. Uh, and actually, I have a picture, if I can, of uh, one of the screenings that Kisilu, if I can borrow that. What? <laughs> this one. Can I pass it up? It might actually be up, isn't it? Oh, there yeah. it is. Great. So, this is Kisilu screening in, in, a, in a school, a pre screening of the trailer. Uh, <laughs> And then, yeah, and now we're working also on how to bring it in, out in local communities. For, for instance, like in, in Europe, to bring it to rural areas, because I think the urban population is more aware of climate change, but we definitely need to also bring it out to, to outside of the cities, because I think often the documentaries, they end up only being in, in the cities. So we're teaming up with local NGOs and communities to do church screenings, school screenings, university screenings, and screenings together with farmers. Brilliant. Then I encourage everybody to see it um, while you're here. It's a fantastic film. Uh, so, Will, uh, um, veteran of many, many documentaries on television, um, very much uh, television rather than documentaries for festivals and things. Uh, so you, you have a history of campaigning for as Keo, uh, Fish Fight, Channel 4, very mainstream and popularist. Um, and Waste, which is your next one, War on Waste, is, is not a very sexy subject. Why on earth did you pitch that, and how on earth did you get it commissioned? Um, these are good questions. Why were we pitching it? I think what, one of the things we learned about doing the sort of story about fish, which was the story of uh, how much fish is thrown away dead when people go fishing in the North Sea, was that the reason people got very uh, involved in the story was because they were reacting to the waste that they saw, basically big boats going out, catching loads of fish, and because they were the wrong ones or they didn't have the right quota for them, they were throwing all these fish back overboard dead. And it was a very powerful image, and it allowed us to launch a big campaign around it, a social media campaign, and we got hundreds of thousands of people signing up and pushed over two or three years, we managed to change the fisheries law in Europe to actually make that practice illegal, which it now is. So when we were talking to the BBC about why that works, waste was the reason, I think. People, I think generally everybody doesn't like waste in their life. But as you say, yeah, it's not the most sexy subject, so um, it took a bit of persuading. But uh, the BBC had some history in this form. They'd done a series, a programme before called The Great British Waste Menu, which had rated well. Um, and so they took a punt, but it was a risk. And when you, when you started off, did you have a very clear idea of, of I mean, waste is huge, you know, is it food, is it plastic, is it, you know, is it the landfills? I mean, it's, you know, it's something that we, you know, how did you focus that down onto sort of clear subjects? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, it's been interesting hearing the other people talk. I think ultimately it's always about story. For, for me, that's the way that we're going to engage audiences. That's the way that we can make compelling television. Um, and so we started not looking at the issue, but looking at the individual stories. Um, and we found, uh, we were looking at food waste in particular, we found a parsnip farming family who live in the UK and they grow lots of parsnips and uh, you know, massive amounts of wastage because the supermarkets reject these parsnips for being the wrong shape, if they're the wrong, slightly the wrong colour or they're too wonky or they're too small. Uh, and they were being forced out of business. There was a family farm that had been you know, growing parsnips for 40 years and suddenly, because of these very strict supermarket standards, they were thinking that they were going to have to close and do something else. So, Suddenly, we had a human way into a bigger story, and I think that's that for me is what we're always looking for: is, is the is the is the sharp angle into these things. Uh, and so we told their story, and we took the wasted parsnips to Morrison's, the supermarket who they supplied, and we gave away free parsnips outside their shop, and we just generally pissed Morrison's off as much as we could to make everybody think that this was ridiculous until Morrison's were forced on camera to say, you're right, this is ridiculous, um, we're going to change it. So, and can you still buy wonky parsnips in Morrison's? There are wonky parsnips in Morrison's, and then they've extended the range. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can I get bought some most root yeah. now. One, I bought uh, some wonky cucumbers in Sainsbury's. There actually. you go, yeah. So, and I was astonished to see that. No, all the supermarkets have done it. And, you know, this is a reason I think we should all be reasonably optimistic is, is that people, you know, we can, things will happen. You know, the, the, we're always kind of trying to sort of stick it to the man a bit in our films and try and change the system for the better. But most big corporations don't like being embarrassed on national television to an audience of millions of people. You know, it's not good for their brand. So if you can, you know, find the way in and humiliate them enough, they will change. So, so have, have we as filmmakers on this subject, have we been too polite up until now? 
Well, I'm obviously doing something that's, you know, d deliberately edgy and provocative. You know, that's where I like pushing on those doors. Um, so it's, I mean, as you said, it's a, we need lots of different stories for lots of different audiences. But this is, you know, I am, I'm trying to get five million people watching my programmes. And therefore, we need to be stunty and we need to be populist and we need to be provocative. And we need to be banging our drum as loudly as we can in people's faces. So that's, that. I, you know, I get off on that. Yeah. And this is obviously for the BBC, who, who can't be seen to campaign. Um, how did that, is that, I mean, there must be some frustration to that. How, how did you, did that temper your message and you're sticking it to the man or, or not? Well, the BBC has a department, as some of you will know, called the Editorial Policy Department, who lots of people have, think have a very bad reputation. I actually get on very well with the Editorial Policy Department. Yeah, they help you tell and, the story. And yeah. they, do, they empower us to find the way to tell the story. So, yes, the BBC, unlike Channel 4, cannot campaign with the capital C, but uh, they can make a documentary about a man who's doing a campaign. And the difference between that is... <laughs> it's subtle, but it's important. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, so basically, climate change underpins everything you do. Um, are you an activist? You is that you know what comes first? I mean, obviously, it's stories. But yeah, a story comes. And you first. never you never come at it head on. Is that is that? I think it's really hard. I, I, I'm sitting here thinking maybe it's a failure of my imagination to to be able to come up with a way of coming at it head on because obviously Ash has done it and Julia, you're doing it. You know, so clearly it is possible. But. My view is, is that it is the, the subject alone is too big um, for any one TV program or series to tackle. There's too many different facets of it. There's too many different elements. And so what I'm trying to do over the course of the years of making my films, a bit like a Trivial Pursuit piece, is, is fill in the, the, the cheeses. You know, I'm doing, we've done something on fisheries. We've done something on the Ibor de Rainforest, which is about deforestation in the Amazon. I did a film about the last coal mine in the UK, which obviously, you know, I've done a series about migration called Exodus, which is a climate change story in another, in another guise. So bit by bit, I'm trying to pick off the various areas, and I hope that when I retire to the TV graveyard that I will be able to look back and see that somehow there's a body of work that has talked about this subject in the, in the round. But who knows whether one day I'll wake up with the right idea for how we do it as a, as a single issue. But I, I, I think... I think the audience doesn't really want to go there, and I think the commissioning... Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough sell. Well, it's interesting. You know, Ash started off saying that you know, he felt it was poison challenge, and I think a lot of filmmakers feel like that, and I think a lot of the audience is like, so why is it such a sort of, oh, God, I'd rather go and, you know, cut somebody else's toenails than watch an environmental film? You know, why is that? What is it about it that turns people off? I, I think it might suffer from being done badly in the past. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say, but I think there's quite a lot of sort of navel-gazing and, you know, slightly boring and depressing films that have been put out there. I think, you know, the, the, I'm going to mix all my words horribly now, but the climate is changing in commissioning. The climate about climate changing is, is changing. There is, there's, I think you see it amongst the young people today. They, as you were saying, your 16 to 24-year-olds were watching your film. You know, young people are more environmentally conscious and engaged so it's different now than it was five years ago, and it'll be different again in five years' time. So I, I think, again, there's reason to be optimistic to think that people want to put this stuff on their channels. Um, it's just finding the right way to do it. And for me, that's all about stories. Yeah, so, so basically, if you're pitching, pitch a story, don't pitch the big thing. Yeah, or pitch the human angle, like, like Julia does. You know, that's, we, you need to find the way into it. I, I just, it's too solid, it's too, it's too big a thing to, to bang your head against the subject, you know, Flat on. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Uh, Jeff, uh, we're all climate change believers. You're an American. How is Donald Trump? <laughs> Just starting with the big questions. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's, it's awesome to be on the panel and to hear the thinking with all of these filmmakers. Uh, it's very much the same sort of thinking that our team goes through in terms of story comes first, how do you make it accessible? Nobody's trying to sell these projects as a climate story. That's not the selling point, necessarily. Um, uh, what is your question about Donald Trump? Well, it, it, I mean, <laughs> basically, you, you are operating in a country and, uh, which is full of sceptics, which is led by one of the biggest climate changes, <coughs> sceptics, deniers. How, how, do, how, does that, how does that affect yeah. your position as a filmmaker tackling this subject? Does it make it yeah, easier yeah. or harder? Um, 
I, I don't know if it's necessarily easier or harder, but it has given us clarity on audience and who we're looking to communicate with. And in many ways, um, Donald Trump does represent a lot of the American populace. There is a lot of skepticism. There is a lot of doubt. Um, that doubt has been manufactured and created intentionally by vested interests um, to confuse the public on an issue that they don't want the public to move on. And so... Uh, when when we've been thinking about our projects, um, it's it's always with that audience in mind to a large degree. Um, I don't think I'd be doing if the United States, if our country was very proactive, if if all global leaders were very proactive on climate change. I don't know if I would be doing the type of filmmaking that we're doing right now. Um, in that, I feel like there's what we've been trying to bring to the table is some sort of visual evidence of what's going on. Um, a lot of skeptics, uh, they hear the arguments or they hear the stories around the planet is changing and they just immediately say, oh, it's just part of a natural cycle and they dismiss all of it. And this framing around this, these two words, natural cycle, that's all they think, that's all they hear, and anything that, that says that the planet is changing is just um, BS in, in that worldview. And it's really, first of all, that's massively infuriating. It's like the scientists who discovered natural cycles are saying that this is not a natural cycle, right? It's the same fields of science that have, have informed us that these changes are happening far, far faster than ever documented before. Um, yet the skeptics don't hear that. So um, for us, we've been trying to figure out, is there a way to make stories, to capture imagery, to, to create evidence that does showcase, look, this is not just an extreme, an aberrant extreme weather event. Um, so Chasing Ice was your, yeah. was your, was your um, previous film, which was providing evidence of the melting of glaciers yeah. and, and mm -hmm. it's it's there, you can see mm -hmm. it and it's shocking. And it was a fantastic success. And at that point did you did you sort of feel like, right, I've done my climate change film or or you know, and how did this how did Chasing Coral come about? Yeah, well even at the start of Chasing Ice we didn't want it to be a climate change film. We were starting as a uh, it was a portrait of the photographer, and this one project, his ICE project, w played a strong role in it. And over time, every test screening that we did, um, audiences just wanted to know more and more about the ICE story. And we had to, while in the edit, we had to completely flip the structure upside down to make it focused much more on climate change. Um, and we, we started going on tour with that film in the United States, trying to bring it to skeptical audiences, actively seeking out audiences that didn't necessarily resonate with climate messaging. And we were looking for schools, for churches, for all of these um, unexpected communities to share the film in. And we were finding really, really great impact of shifting hearts and minds, shifting mindset, because we were going in with this visual story, a story that they could understand. Um, there's limited science in the film, but enough for you to wrap your head around why these melting glaciers mattered. Um, and, and then it was in that process of us sharing the film that we learned about this ocean story. And we were learning that the, the coral reefs were changing pretty dramatically. And it was at that stage where we were debating if we should continue with the, the touring effort or if we should make this new film. And we decided to make the film in part because I, nobody's ever seen, I hadn't seen imagery of coral reefs bleaching, of the changes happening to coral reefs. Um, coral, coral bleaching is basically effectively when it dies. And you know that lovely yeah. white coral that you have in your bathroom? That's dead coral, and this is what the film's doing. So um, at, at the time, uh, the story of coral bleaching was a very fringe thing. Just a small part of the scientific community uh, knew what was going on. But at this stage now, we've seen massive global... Uh, there was a huge global coral bleaching event from 2014 to 2016, and then it continued into this year. It is 100% directly linked to temperature. It, when the oceans get hot, you can look at the satellite data, you can see where the hot water is going, and a couple of weeks later, that coral will, will turn white um, from, from the heat, and if it stays like that for too long, it just flat out dies. And so, in the last two years, in 2016 and 2017, we've lost half the Great Barrier Reef from hot water, just cooked to death. Um, there's should, we, should we show a clip? Oh, um, we... Yeah, the clip that we have is the trailer, so it just kind of is a, a bit of an overview just launched last week. There's moments where you see the, the, the living and the dead coral. It's, it's such a wake-up call. 
Were you, I mean, I mean, you made this film. You must have known what you were after. But witnessing it and seeing it, is that... Was, were you just oh, it was... Um, our team, uh, we were chasing this uh, bleaching event for a couple of years. We were traveling all around the planet just trying to get this imagery. And it had always just been slightly out of our grasp. Um, and last year, in 2016, our team went to Australia in January. It was supposed to be a two-month trip. Um, there were all sorts of complications in, in it, uh, logistically and technically, and then it kept getting extended three months and then four months, in part because the the reef was changing continuously while we were there. And uh, we we witnessed the entire slaughter of an ecosystem, this entire reef that we were diving on. 95% of it at least died in two months. And uh, it was devastating. Like our team, um, the subject, one of the subjects of the film, Zach, when we came back, I, I thought we needed PTSD counseling just based on like the trauma. Just uh, explain, Zach, Zach is a guy that was brought up in inland well, America. Yeah, and in some the middle of the in, country. Middle of the countryside, miles, miles from the sea, but became a kind of coral nerd. He had his own sort of fish right. tanks, but no fish, but just coral. And he's a brilliant central character, isn't he? Um, yeah, and, and that goes back to the point of trying to tell human stories and, and get human narratives into these in terms of... Um, it's so much easier to relate to Zach than it is to relate to a fish in some ways. Um, most of... In most ways, I'd say. In most ways, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the only real successful like nature programs that are completely animal-centric are just anthropomorphizing the animals. They're trying to get you to feel and relate to some sort of a humanized story within animals. Um, and here we, we had a, a cast of subjects, and Zach in particular, who had such passion for the um, for this ecosystem that hopefully audiences fall in love with it and care about the story through Zach's eyes. I mean, it's, it was a very challenging film, not least because it's a global story, but, you know, filming underwater. What were the sort of, yeah. you know, technical filmmaker challenges you had to actually overcome? I mean, for me, uh, that's, that's the fun part. Um, I got into this as a cinematographer, and so learning new gear, learning um, how to shoot underwater, uh, those are technical challenges that you sort of just learn while doing. Um, we definitely work with a lot of other uh, underwater cinematographers, but learning how to dive and dive well and uh, well enough to be able to control where you're at, it actually is a really, really fun way to shoot because you are your own drone, steady cam, cable cam, crane, all at the same time. Um, you can control your vertical ascent or descent just with your lungs. And then you can propel yourself with your legs and you can move your body. So you can do really easy, like sweeping 360 shots um, by yourself uh, underwater. So it's a really, really fun way to shoot. Yeah. And you had to sort of develop your own camera systems to because you yes. sort of have this sort of complicated time I mean time lapse is difficult anyway but when you're underwater with the tides and swells and is it sort of you know could you did you have to bring a different set of people in to make this oh yeah I mean in, in many ways this was uh, building a lot of equipment from the ground up um, we built a drone very early on to fly the red camera um, where there wasn't anything commercially available at the time but for the underwater stuff as you'll see in the film like this dome had this custom windshield wiper on it and all custom electronics so we could shoot 4k underwater time lapses um, our team built the we believe is the world's first underwater solar panel application so as long as the this battery pack was in about 30 feet or ideally 20 feet or less of water um, it would still be able to charge the battery even while underwater not as efficient as it would be on the surface but still better than nothing um, so the whole team we were just figuring out how to solve these problems as we went along how, how can you make a camera system that can sit autonomously for a couple of months to, to document uh, what was changing there so were complications there but um, yeah. you'll see that in the film yes Wires and things yeah. under, and seawater, not a happy mix. Um, so this is, it's going to be on Netflix. Yeah. Um, global audience rather than a domestic territory audience selling out. At, was, is, what do you think the benefit of that, launching it sort of globally as opposed to territory by territory? Um, I think the most interesting thing for me, I, I'll, I'll get to your question, but it's sort of through this roundabout way in that... Um, what we did with Chasing Ice was a lot of local screenings. We wanted to screen it locally for communities that didn't 
that we wanted to engage with that didn't really get the issue. Um, most distribution models have some sort of a tension or conflict with doing free local screenings. Um, if you're trying to sell ancillary rights, if you're trying to sell digital downloads, if you're trying to sell DVDs, um, us coming into a community to do a free event has some conflict with potential rights in, in that space. And Netflix was super, super clean because it's just available through the subscription. Pretty much everybody or anybody in a group of people has some sort of a Netflix subscription, likely. Um, so we can now work with uh, Netflix as the distributor. And first of all, we can do screenings in schools for free. We're not trying to sell $300 licenses as one-offs to recoup anything. Um, so any school can screen the film for free. And then we can also work with community groups to screen the film for free, where anybody in that you know local organization, whoever's got a Netflix account, can just hook up their laptop to a projector and screen it for their community. Um, or we can come in and support that and build it out into a bigger screening as well. So when we looked at the entire um, set of opportunities for distributing the, a feature film, Netflix was the cleanest for the impact that we wanted to accomplish. And that was really one of the big decision makers for us in terms of being able to leverage that partnership to be able to bring it to these new audiences. So I mean, it's been, everybody's made fantastic films, but is it enough to make the film and, and, and broadcast it? I mean, you know, it's a question for everybody, but it, you know, how much is campaigning part of your film when you start making? Obviously, it's and for, for us, it was beginning. for us it was something that we did think about from the beginning on this project. Once again, going back to as American filmmakers uh, recognizing that we are probably the biggest problem on climate change right now um, globally. This is this is a huge, huge issue in the States that we're not moving fast enough. In, an, in a very odd and ironic way, um, President Trump pulling out of the Paris Agreement has sparked this massive um, kind of resurgence in climate action. Um, there are so many cities, corporations, philanthropists who have now pledged that the United States will still keep to the Paris Agreement even without President Trump's or with a federal level involvement. And God bless him. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's amazing to see, and it is all at the local level. And that's where I think, in, certainly in the United States, we're only going to see progress happen in the next few years at the local level. The technology is changing. The, adapt, the adoption of the new technology is happening very quickly. And if we incentivize things at the local level and really support it at the local level, we can both still keep to the um, commitment, but we're, that's a far greater, more kind of deeply rooted change than we would have through federal regulation. So in this very, very odd twist of fate, it's, it's a great time for climate solutions right now. Good. So, so Zach found it very painful. Uh, you've been on record saying that you found making Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral very painful. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you going to make another climate change film? I, I don't want to keep um, searching out and, and looking for the places where the planet is dying, dying and falling apart. There's nothing, you know, I, I got into this to explore the beauty of the planet. I mean, I mean, the overview effect, like seeing it from space, this beautiful marble that we live on. I got into this wanting to be a Nat Geo photographer, wanting to see this planet. And... Um, all of my friends and peers who are Nat Geo photographers or adventure photographers, like everybody's in the same depressed state of how bad things are for the planet. Um, that is, that's why our team is so focused on this campaign work, is that it, unless we do this now, if we don't move the needle now, then, then we're never going to have that opportunity. Climate change will never be as cheap as, as it is right now to solve. Every waiting day, every waiting month or year, it's just going to become more and more expensive, more painful, more human suffering. And so it really is a matter of trying to, to have this shift in consciousness as soon as possible. And hopefully if we get to that point of, of some sort of stability or the right path that we're on, then, then we'll keep thinking through what the next films are and the next stories are. Okay, thank you. So, mm -hmm. Joe, you, uh, you know a lot about climate change and a lot about media, a lot of different stories, a lot of different takes on this panel, all brilliant, obviously. Um, you know, are we just preaching to the converted? Well, um, I, I should start by saying that I think, uh, to cheer you all up, I will just observe that the glass is half full. So um, I first met this particular issue of climate change in, I think, 1986, 
and I was sitting in a study bedroom of a couple of uh, maths students at Cambridge University. The three of us made up the Cambridge University uh, Greens group, and uh, he'd come back. One of them had come back from a, a supervision with their tutor, an eminent professor, um, who had just been to uh, a significant conference on the science of climate change. So. They rushed in and said, I've, I've got some, some good news for you, and that's that it looks like the ozone hole is less of a problem than we thought. I've also got some bad news for you, and then described the basic mechanics of climate change. And um, I kind of looked at one face and then another, and I thought, actually, this doesn't feel like the core of a movement uh, that's up to uh, responding to the scale of this challenge. However, <laughs> within uh, 25 short years, a little, a little over, um, we are at the point where two thirds of people across the planet, so this now includes global south urban populations, are concerned or very concerned about climate change. That's in polling done internationally by Ipsos Mori. And uh, about the same population not just think climate change is happening, but think that it's human caused. That's an astounding achievement, given what a really tricksy story it is to tell for all the reasons you lot have brilliantly described. Um, and that's an achievement of the media. That's an achievement not of academics. It's not an achievement of the policy community. That's an achievement of storytellers. And I mean, I'm sure you'll all share my delight at going to films across the last couple of days. Um, really gifted storytelling. So the glass is half full, and I think the question now is how you fill the other half. And um, the, the long version of the answer to that question is in, I was brought up in an analog world, so we do have some paper copies. Um, a report I did um, with Mark for the International Broadcasting Trust, Climate Change on Television. Really condensing my answer to that, uh, we asked ourselves the question, you know, we've just seen Paris go by, we've seen virtually every government in the United Nations system committing to do something they don't know how to do in a very short space of time. And we asked the question, what's the responsibility of broadcasters given that they've all done that? North Korea have supplied intended national contributions. So, um, that, I think, is a challenge directly to ITV, BBC, Discovery, and a lot. Um, if North Korea decides... So, so are, you, are you sort of saying yeah. broadcasters are not doing enough? They're not playing their so, part? So, I, I think there's been a couple of comments about how this is all about story, that you've made the point beautifully that you've got to make different films for different audiences. And I think broadcasters know that. Commissioners get and keep their jobs by having a gut instinct about where their audiences are. And I think they are right to think that, you know, the soup to nuts of climate change told in a, in a three hour chunk is probably not the way to do it. But I think we've seen evidence today of how you can break this story down. One, I think, thing that's helpful to me certainly is to understand the scale of the issue. And, you know, something, um, I would suggest is that this is as big as, as Darwin and Darwinism was for the 19th century in completely transforming how we think who we are in the world. And so to suggest that we'll fit that into a 60 minute special, let alone a half hour, um, is nuts. Rather, I think it makes sense to think about climate change as being the condition for any story we tell. Mm -hmm. And in that regard... Or every story we tell. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and in that regard, just try and, you know, have sensitivity to how you can draw on a thread, pull on a thread, expand out a story. I mean, you know, you made a, a whole show that was more or less about coffee cups, and it, it just was a story about climate change at one level. The way we think about everyday things we use and touch in, in developed world settings, this is a story about climate change. So... Ingenuity in that case was required, quality storytelling, great talent, etc. Um, so it can be done. Um, if there were one thing that I think we have all neglected as a story, though, and I would really challenge us to pick it up, is, um, is the cost of carbon. 
So have we put the right Sounds cost of... Sounds sexy. I can see commissioners so, going for that. <laughs> exa exactly so. That's why we haven't gone near it. But either we leave everyone in the room and everyone watching the telly trying to kind of micromanage uh, questions about, mm, should I go on this flight or not? Should I offset it? Um, uh, or virtue signalling, if they use a reusable bottle. Um, yes, how many... Hands up, in, who's got it, a plastic bottle on them with water in it now? Hands up. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, but, but if we can tell effective stories about how uh, the responsible and the vulnerable, as in your story and the shot of the bread, um, are connected together and we can do something about that, you know, with our tax system, with our political system, then, uh, then we'll get to the other half of the glass. And I, I think that... Um, you know, this is only one strand of it, but one of the strands that you all need, I think, to engage with is the join between politics, economics, and a fast-changing nature. Um, so, so what's your advice to the filmmakers in the audience? What, 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 should, what should they be doing more of? How can we, how, what is their responsibility in this? And, and, and how can we turn this round from everybody slightly rolling their eyes and, and broadcasters going, I'll do it because it's Earth Day, to actually, you know, how, can, how do we make that as filmmakers? How do we cause more creative... Well, first of all, we should uh, acknowledge in, in this country the case of, of Channel 4 and the example of Netflix, perhaps similarly, of taking risks, you know, opening the checkbook and um, allowing risks to be taken and experiments to be run. I think if you look up what Channel 4 did for Earth Day this year, um, Western Flag... Um, this commission, there was a third commission, um, Guy or Vince uh, will get you there in a search. Um, they took a risk and it paid off, is all that I can understand. Yeah. Um, what else, uh, what would we do across the next 10 years in terms of storytelling? Well, I'm going to take you to one project. Oh, yes, by the way, there's a few links to projects I'm involved in at the moment that I won't expand on, but you can find out more about. Earth in Vision is the one I'm referencing. We've had enormous fun looking at 50 years of the BBC's environment archive. So this is not a new story, is a helpful point. Yeah. So I'm going to take you to 1974. I'm going to take you to a specific programme called Power to the People that was made by... Uh, uh, it, it was one in a strand where a different talent uh, led the show. Um, and in, in this case, uh, a very celebrated... Um, uh, natural history broadcaster um, told a story about energy. And in the case of uh, 50 Minutes, it sounds very unpromising, um, but it had an immensely perky, light touch tone. It started in uh, a kind of uh, temple of working class culture, the Blackpool Illuminations, and it told a story within that uh, short program of the technological, behavioural changes that could be taken. Now, the interesting thing about this story is it doesn't reference climate change at all, but almost everything it proposes we should do across the whole suite, technological, economic, in the home, was told with a tone um, that spoke directly to the uh, working-class audience, who was a, a, a strong uh, uh, portion of that talent's uh, kind of you know, um, audience. Um, now, the interesting thing about him is that he's uh, been a con climate contrarian for the last 15 years. And I'd love to know the reasons for that. I think it's because he's a naturalist and conservationist and um, was profoundly frustrated that it was knocked off uh, the schedules. But what that demonstrated to me was that we've known how to tell these stories before. A long time. They're yeah. not always stories about climate change. In that case, it's about how we should sip, not gulp so energy. So it's about ingenuity. It's yeah. about coming at it from it's. It's about um, yeah. It's about being yeah. filmmakers, storytellers, as opposed to documenting documenting things. Yeah, and there's a there's a lovely phrase from a poet, Kathleen Jamie, um, who invites us to extend the web of our noticing, and something that I think you've touched on is but through taking a human story that draws points of connection but in a very emotionally engaging way between change in the natural world, change in the experience of the most vulnerable and our own implicit responsibility for that. 
So I mean, as, as storytelling film, can make as that explicit. Storytelling, but as filmmakers, we have a response. But just a question for everybody. How green were you as a production? Ashley, were you green as a production? We, we logged Jeff? all of our miles, all of our travel, and it's being offset. Um, uh, most of our core team either has electric cars or hybrids. Um, probably like 12 people close on our editing side, all uh, editing in our, our post house in Boulder. Um, so every and half so, of our so it's team is completely vegetarian. embedded in what you do. I mean, yeah, uh, I, it's, it's know, interesting. Ash, you're smiling. <laughs> is this an awkward green. question for you? <laughs> no, um, no. I mean, it's it just not. Uh, but it's an interesting question. But it, it, it's not. Um, you know, the, the kind of the, the demands of. You know, we were up against a, a, a fixed TX, and just the demands of getting that out in time, you know, in advance of Earth Day, just dictated. But a lot of broadcasters just... are signed up to Albert now and other schemes, and, yeah. and, and were you part of, were you kind of in, encouraged by the broadcaster to take um, part in that scheme? I don't know if people I, know about this, but no, there's schemes I mean, that, that, you know, and Sky were very, very heavy duty about this, that you had to sign up to it. And, yeah. Um, no, not. I mean, I can't say it was a sort of guiding philosophy about how we made the film. Um, but, Do you think it should be? Would you Would you change I'm, that now? Yeah, I think possibly so. I mean, um, yeah. Why don't you say yeah. right now, not possibly that it would be? Maybe so. that's a pledge. Yeah. Right, we got it. Here we go. One pledge, right. They are now going to be greener in their productions. Result, one thing. Okay, anybody else? Green, are you green in your productions? We are signed up to Albert, yeah. yeah. And I think. Um, yeah, we, we, we try and order all of our productions and we, are, we, we look at it. And I think, uh, you know, partly that's driven by Hugh, who's one of the owners of the company and obviously has a, you know, res re ethical responsibility and reputation to uphold. And so we make sure that we don't just buy slabs of water and chuck them in the boot of a car, you know, where people take their own water bottles and those sorts of yeah. things. They're, they're, they are part of the culture. And Julia, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't need to ask you this, really, do I? I mean, you, as an activist... It's completely embedded in your daily life, I would assume. But was it challenging for you when you had to get on lots of planes and... Yeah, of course. And I mean, we haven't been able to be as green as we would have wanted because of the budgets. Like, but, but at the other hand, also because of the budgets, we have a limited resources. So that also... Then you have to <laughs> find solutions which are not using that many resources yeah. also. So I'm going to come to the audience for questions, but as usual, running out of time. Um, just, just before we do, we talked about the pledge. I mean, and, and we've already got one pledge. Hooray! Arrow, we're going to be green. I'm going to hold you to that. Um, so we sort of said, you know, and it was interesting what we talked about. So can everybody just very briefly discuss an area, something that you would, would, would encourage us to pledge to, Jeff? Um, it... In many ways, we're talking about climate change, but I do think that the bigger issue here is the Anthropocene. Like, it is a broader uh, context. It is how human humanity interacts and relates with the planet. Has everybody heard the phrase Anthropocene? I'm seeing most yeses. So, um, Just explain it for those who uh, don't know. If we are, we've entered into a new geologic era when where humans are the greatest, biggest influence on this planet, um, more so than any other factor. And uh, resource usage is, re resources and climate change, they kind of go hand in hand in this like meta problem that we're dealing with right now. Um, so one specific tangible thing in regards to resources and with regards to coral reefs specifically, um, Eating non-organic food, like the pesticides and fertilizer runoff from those foods, is killing the ocean. Um, so in the United States, the Gulf of Mexico is a complete dead zone, uh, mostly because of agricultural runoff down the Mississippi River that has flooded this area and it's completely dead. And one thing that I, I didn't even realize before working on this project, like you can think about eating organic. That sounds organic. like your next film, maybe. Uh, possibly, <laughs> unlikely, but... Um, uh, eating organic actually has a huge uh, impact on on the oceans as well. Brilliant. So one small thing. Julia. Yeah, so I, I think it's key. We have to do all of these things in our life, and like eating organic and cycling and all of this. But I think it's also key that we spread it further than just ourselves. If we just get good conscious ourselves, like there's so many people mm -hmm. who won't act unless we spread the word to them. So I would actually urge people to talk with people, maybe three people today, talk with them about about climate change and what, what inspired you from this event? Each day and every day of your life. Can we all... Um, sorry. sorry. Quick, just quick, because we're running out of time. We do want to get some questions in. 
Uh, last night I met a Chinese architecture student who's here doing uh, the brilliant Sheffield School. Uh, so I'm reminded by him of Buckminster Fuller, the design futurist, and a phrase, do more with less. Me and everyone else, we should do more with less. Will? Uh, I was going to say be active and not passive. I think there's one thing I've learned through all my films is that well, there, are, there is stuff that I learn every time that I make a film and I try and fold that into my life and it makes me feel that I am doing a small things and optimistic about the possibility for change. Great. Right. Questions? Anybody any questions? You had your hand up a minute ago. I have a question for Jeff. Um, just interested to know what sort of resistance you face, especially as a barrier reef from the Australian authorities mm. and the scuba industry, whether it's something they wanted to admit to. Uh, because I was in Australia earlier this year and it seems that they don't really want to, they play it down. It's mind-boggling and painful. Um, the tourism industry in Australia, uh, we were there last year, so I don't know how things have changed much this year with the continued bleaching that happened this year. Um, but much of the tourism industry has just denied how bad it is, and they've masked it. And, um, and the, the interesting thing is when people go scuba diving, they get brought to the prettiest, most pristine part. And you can lose 99% of something and they still just take you to the 1% and like, oh, it's still fine. Um, so it, it is really short-sighted thinking. It's, it's a short-term uh, wanting to keep the tourism industry healthy now mm -hmm. while not recognizing that if they don't address this, they will lose the, enti like the thing that the entire tourism industry is based on. Um, so it's, it's rather painful. They try and stop you from no, filming No, we them. haven't had, um, we've been working with the Great Barrier Marine Park Authority um, in terms of getting permission to film. Uh, we're working with all the leading scientists. The scientists in Australia are incredibly frustrated by Garumpa and the and the whole, um, that's the Great, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Um, it, it is, it's painful for the scientists, um, but they haven't tried to resist the film at all. Um, some, of, some of the people within that organization have seen Chase and Coral, but um, we're very excited to release the film in Australia. I'm also very curious to see what the response will be in Australia. No. Anyone else? Yes. Pledges, maybe one small pledge we could do is to green the dock press as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I used to be, I was on the board, and, and one of the things I said, and this is why you see, I would like to have glass cups, but there used to be bottles of water, and I stopped that happening. So yeah. yeah, so I still nag them about that. But I think that's something. This is something that you can all do. Yeah. The Sheffield Dock Fest wants feedback. If every single one of you said make it greener, they would have to take that on board. Okay, but yeah. my question was, is there on the organic food thing? Because um, I lived in London for a very long time, and then I moved back to Dublin, and the culture shock is massive. Because um, Ireland's a really small country, really small population, really small market. Organic food is really expensive and not much available. Like even though we have Tesco's, their organic range is nothing like what they have in the UK. So is there a film or is there any particular film you'd recommend anyone on organic food and this poisonous runoff? I don't know of any... Uh, ask Google. No. Um, okay, but there isn't any that you Just would know. one observation on this. You know, we ask what stories there are, what broadcasters should do. I think questions about technology meets economics, meets taste, meets climate change are profoundly complex. And um, personally, you know, I've got a list of things I've changed my mind about, things I should change my mind about, etc. So GM is currently in my things I think I should probably change my mind about. Um, I won't expand on which way, but it's just an example of how I think actually this is a rich terrain of stories. None, none of them are really straightforward. Right. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. uh, one, and there's one, so sorry, many. Yeah. We've got one minute left. Yes. Um, you know, a massive issue is that governments are subsidising the fossil fuel industry to carry on developing fossil fuels. So there's all these really big issues in the in the topic, and um, I just want to talk a bit. Um, wonder if you could talk a bit more about how we attack those kind of very important big issues again. I mean, fossil fuel subsidies are I so. Think, I think you know, the first may speak to the panel because we've only got thirty seconds left. I think I would throw that back to you as filmmakers, and I think what you've heard from today it's about finding the story, finding the human, finding the personal take. Um, and so, in a way, I think that's that's something that everybody in this room, oh, that's a challenge, how do we do it? And if everybody leaves this being creatively inspired about wanting to make a documentary in this area, then that's been a fantastic result of, of having this session. So I think maybe one last question, if we're 
quick or just okay super quick and then because some people are waving at me from the back and i thought super quick um you you mentioned donald trump and i and i wonder whether fifteen thousand years old fifty thousand years of human civilization means that we're still cave people scared of the saber-toothed tiger uh, outside and, and perhaps we need an enemy people keep talking about fighting climate change and having a battle and such like we don't have an enemy there isn't something to fight here. And, and maybe Donald Trump putting himself up as a straw man is useful. Yeah, maybe well, we need a, yeah. a, a, a blowfelt, an evil, an evil sort of organization that. that we love, can, no, no, we're all we can we're all sort of supporters fight now. against. <laughs> because once we've got something to fight against, if, if aliens were bombing us, ripping our trees down, burning our oceans, we'd know what to do. Yeah, it's that but sense of urgency is, but that, you know, that's up to us as well to, to, to sort of propel that sense of urgency. Okay, I'm so, I, sorry. I totally agree that when, I, when we start our films, what we do is we write down a list of goodies and baddies and we decide who are the targets and we go through them. And then climate change hasn't had a good target until now. And I think it's, you know, we're, we're definitely thinking in that same area. We, we, can, we can do stuff with that. So you don't want him to go? You know, every cloud is still learning. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>